Tonight, we're going to continue in our series looking at a little bit of what the Proverbs have to say about how to make wise decisions in life. Now, when you look at the book of Proverbs, most of the early chapters in the book of Proverbs are written by King Solomon as he is trying to teach his sons how to grow up to be godly young men. And specifically, including how to help them grow up to become godly spouses, godly husbands one day. And so, not surprisingly, one of the topics that King Solomon covers as he's discipling his sons is warning them to protect their marriage against sexual sin. Now tonight, we're going to focus on Proverbs chapter 5, and we're going to learn what Proverbs chapter 5 can teach us about protecting our marriage from sexual sin. Specifically, protecting our marriages from adultery and from pornography. Now, I know this is gonna be a difficult sermon uh, for a lot of us, if not all of us, because no one has a perfect track record when it comes to protecting our marital intimacy. Studies show that something like 25% of marriages experience, div- experience adultery sometime during the course of the marriage. And probably at least 90% of marriages face some sort of challenge in regards to pornography. And so if you've been through any of this in your marriage, I want to just thank you ahead of time for for the courage that you're going to have tonight. Now, this is not going to be the most upbeat, feel-good, or lighthearted sermon of all time, but it may just be the most important sermon you'll ever hear. Because what we're learning tonight, if you take it to heart and put it to work in your life, could save your marriage. Or it could at least protect you from repeating the mistakes of the past. So what I want to do is we're going to look at Proverbs chapter 5, and we're going to go over four principles that can help us protect our marriage. So let's go ahead and start in Proverbs chapter 5, starting in verse 1. The first thing we're going to see is that in order to protect our marriage, we should consider the consequences. Look with me at Proverbs chapter 5, verse 1. My son, see, Solomon's talking to his son, my son, Pay attention to my wisdom. Listen up, right? Lend your ear to my understanding that you may preserve discretion and your lips may keep knowledge. For the lips of an immoral woman drip honey and her mouth is smoother than oil. But in the end, she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death and her steps lay hold of hell. Now, the Bible is honest and admits that sin is pleasurable. But the Bible also warns us that sin is only pleasurable for a season. What that means is sin is pleasurable for an instant, for a moment, for a short time. But what the Proverbs help us to do, and this is one of the great benefits of the Proverbs, is they help us to look past the moment of temptation to the consequences that are going to follow. And the key phrase in verse 4 is when Solomon tells his sons, but in the end, but in the end. You can save yourself a lot of trouble in marriage if you will think of but in the end. The Proverbs help us to consider the end and not just the now. Because verse 5 says that having an affair will end up unleashing loads of death and hell into your life. There is a relational cost of adultery. In that moment of temptation, we've got to ask ourselves, is that few moments with that other person worth losing my family over? Are those few moments with that other person worth losing my wife over? Are those few moments with that other person worth losing my kids over? There's a financial cost to adultery. Did you know that? Adultery is expensive. The legal fees alone of a divorce can cost upwards of $17,000. Do you have $17,000 to pay for a divorce right now? Well, then think twice, right? Um, And that's not even close to the long-term cost of divorce because the biggest cost of divorce is the division of assets. So we have to ask ourselves, are those few moments with that other person worth losing my house? Are those few moments with that other person worth losing half of my retirement savings? Are those few moments worth paying child support and alimony for the rest of my life? Studies have shown that divorce causes an average of a 77% decrease in personal financial wealth. Are you willing 
are ready to give up 77% of your money for the rest of your life. The Proverbs challenge us to consider the consequences. In fact, the Proverbs warn us that these financial consequences are exactly what could happen if we choose to cheat. In fact, look with me at Proverbs chapter 5, verse 9 and 10. Solomon warns his son, he says, basically, don't cheat on your wife, verse 9, lest you give your honor to others and your years to the cruel one, lest aliens be filled with your wealth and your labors go to the house of a foreigner. What does this mean? Well, the Proverbs are intensely practical, okay? And what this is saying is, you better think twice, because if you commit adultery and get divorced because of it, then you may spend the rest of your life funding the amazing Hawaii vacations that your ex-wife and her new husband are gonna go on. (laughs) That's what it says. It says, give it to the house of a foreigner. This means to a stranger, someone you don't know yet. And so, do you wanna pay for your ex-wife and her new husband's renovations on their fancy new house? Or do you wanna pay for their new fancy BMW? Well, if not, the Proverbs invite us to think twice, right? There's a physical cost to adultery. In adultery, you can get STDs. In adultery, there can be unplanned pregnancies. In fact, did you know that adultery can get you killed? It is amazing when you read the book of Proverbs, how many of the Proverbs warn against just that. There's like a dozen that say, don't cheat on your spouse or someone might end up killing you. I mean, you think about it, you cheat, you've created numerous mortal enemies. Your own spouse might kill you. In fact, detectives, when they find a dead person, one of the first suspects they think about is the spouse because it often is the spouse. Um, So your own spouse might kill you the other person's spouse might kill you, uh, and that other person, if you end up leaving them to go back to your spouse, might kill you. And so there is a physical cost to adultery. There's also, and most importantly, a spiritual cost to adultery. The shame of knowing that not only did we sin against our family, but ultimately and worst of all, that we sinned against God. The loss of our witness, perhaps the loss of our ministry at church, When a believer commits adultery, you know what happens? We give the people we've been witnessing to an excuse to stop listening to us. And when a believer commits adultery, we give the enemies of God the opportunity to think that they're right and that Jesus doesn't actually make a difference after all. And so the first principle from chapter five is that in order to protect our marriage, we should consider the consequences. The second principle that we see in Proverbs 5 is that in order to protect our marriage, we should stay as far away from temptation as possible. Solomon warned his sons to stay far away from the seductress. Look with me in Proverbs chapter 5, starting in verse 7. Solomon says, therefore hear me now, my children, see he's talking to his children, and do not depart from the words of my mouth. Remove your way far from her and do not go near the door of her house. This proverb shows us that the best way to resist temptation is to stay as far away from temptation as possible. The best way to fight temptation is to not put yourselves in situations where you have to fight temptation. Isn't that what Solomon says? He says, remove your way far from the seductress and do not go near the door of her house. Now, Paul in the New Testament says pretty much the exact same thing. Look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. This sounds exactly like what Solomon was just saying to his children in Proverbs 5. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, Paul is speaking to married couples. Well, he's speaking to anyone, I guess. And he says, flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Paul in this verse says that there's something different about sexual sin, that there's something that is in some way more devastating about sexual temptation. And so what Paul says here is he says the best way to deal with sexual temptation is not to stand toe to toe in the ring and try to fight it. The best way to deal with sexual temptation is to run away from it to get as far away from it as you possibly can, or the way that Paul says it in the New King James Version is to flee that temptation. The way to resist 
is not to try to stand toe to toe in the ring, because if we try that very long, we're gonna lose. The way to fight temptation is to get out of the ring, to run screaming out of the arena, to hell the first cab, to get in the cab, to drive straight to the airport, to take the first plane to Cape Canaveral, and then to get on the first space shuttle to the moon. To get as far as possible away from it. When I was wrestling, um, there was a particularly devastating wrestling move called the leg vine. And if your opponent got you wrapped up in the leg vine, it was very hard to get out of it. And so what our wrestling coach, Coach Kerr, would do is he would sit us all down on the mat and he would say, all right, men, that's how he talked. He said, how do you get out of the leg vine? Sorry, if I keep doing that, I'm going to lose my voice. He says, uh, he would say, how do you get out of the leg vine? And in unison, all of us were supposed to say, by never getting in it, coach. The move was so devastating that the best way to get out of it was not to be in situations where you get into it. Well, that's what sexual temptation is like. It is such a devastating move that it's hard to get out of once you're in it. And so the best way to get out of it is to not let yourself get in it, to stay far away from not just the sin, but even the possibility of temptation. Now, how do we actually do this in everyday life? How do we, as Solomon says, stay far away from sexual temptation if we're married or even if we're single? Um, or how do we, as Paul says, how do we flee sexual immorality? Well, let me give you some examples, some real life examples of ways that you could flee, stay far away from it. First of all, let's think about adultery. Some ways that you could take practical steps to stay far away from even the temptation of adultery. One of the easiest ways is to decide to never be alone with someone of the opposite gender who is not your spouse. So what this would mean is like a husband deciding to never be alone with another woman who's not his wife, or a wife deciding not to be alone with another man who's not her husband. Now, you may have heard this before, and sometimes it's referred to as the Billy Graham rule. The reason it's referred to as the Billy Graham rule is because Billy Graham really popularized this rule. Remember that Billy Graham was a traveling preacher, and he spent a lot of times in hotel rooms, which bring their own set of dangers. And, you know, Billy was a good looking guy. He was famous. Many people admired him. And so he wanted to make sure that there was never any possibility of him even being in a tempting situation. And so he decided that while he was traveling around and all the time, in fact, that he would not be alone with a woman who is not his wife. Now, the Billy Graham rule is not easy in today's world. It's awkward. It's sort of old school and outdated. People might label it sexist, or they might think that it's weird, but you know what? It's pretty much foolproof. With some bizarre exceptions, if you are never alone with someone who's not your spouse, then you pretty much can't commit adultery, right? In fact, our entire offices at the church are built on this principle. All of our office doors have windows on the door. You know, not every door on earth has a window on it, but all of our office doors do, so that everybody in the office can always see what's going on in our office. The very few doors in our offices that don't have windows, we have a rule that if you're meeting with someone of the opposite gender, you have to leave the door open. And so our entire offices are built on this Billy Graham rule. Now, another example of ways to flee sexual morality and to stay far away from even the possibility of that temptation is to not flirt with people who aren't your spouse. Now, sometimes people say, oh, come on, Brian, you're being legalistic, you're being hardcore. I mean, it's just flirting, it's just, it's innocent. Well, I don't know. Is it really innocent? I mean, if you ask God to really look into your heart, is it innocent that you're flirting with people who are not your spouse, right? I mean, if you want to flirt with someone, why don't you flirt with your spouse? Uh, but here's the problem, is let's theoretically say, which I doubt it, but let's theoretically say it actually was innocent flirting. Well, even if it was, what happens when the other person flirts back? Let's say I'm a married person and I'm at my place of work and I say to this woman at my job, I say, oh, I love your new haircut. You just look amazing in that. And then what if she says, I'm so glad you like it. I was hoping that you would like it. Whoa, what? Wait a minute. That's not an appropriate conversation for me to be in, right? Now I'm in the ring. I don't want to be in the ring. I want to be as far away from the ring as possible. So don't flirt with people who are not your spouse. Another example of fleeing and staying far away from temptation is we've got to be careful about what levels of relationship we have 
with people of the opposite gender who are not our spouse. Sometimes there are married people who have best friends who are the opposite gender. And we gotta be careful about that. You know, sometimes there are wives who have best friends who are men, and sometimes there are husbands who have best friends who are women. We gotta be careful. If we need a best friend on earth, why don't we pick one of the four billion people on earth who happen to be the same gender as us? Pick one of them to be your best friend. Or better yet, why don't we work on being best friends of our spouse, right? And so we gotta be careful what levels of relationships we're opening ourselves up to. I've done so, so, so much marriage counseling with couples who have experienced adultery. And I think more often than not, if I think back, physical affairs start with emotional affairs. And so we gotta be careful what level of relationship we have with people of the opposite gender and how emotionally vulnerable we're being with them. For example, another way to flee this temptation is to be careful what kind of conversations we're having with people of the opposite gender who are not our spouse. So we gotta be careful. There are some levels of openness and transparency and some levels of vulnerability that if we need to have those kind of conversations, let's pick one of the four billion people on earth who happen to be the same gender as us, right? Let me give you an example. Let's say I'm walking around the church and I'm looking upset and some girl in the church says, Pastor Brian, what's wrong? Oh, me and my wife were just fighting this morning and I don't know, I just, sometimes I just feel like my wife doesn't appreciate me. Okay, that's an inappropriate level of emotional vulnerability with another woman who's not my wife. If I wanna talk to someone about that, I should probably talk to my wife about that, right? Okay, so, because imagine, what if she says this? What, Pastor Brian? I can't imagine that. Every day I think about what a wonderful man you are and how I would appreciate you if I was married to you. <laughs> now, by the way, this is hypothetical. This has never happened, all right? <laughs> but my point is, that's, whoa, that's inappropriate. All of a sudden I'm in the ring. I don't wanna be in the ring, right? I wanna be as far away from possible. Another example of how to flee the temptation is there are some levels of physical contact. Well, let me back up. There are most levels of physical contact that we should not be having with people of the opposite gender who are not our spouse. There are some husbands that are just way too touchy with other women that aren't their wife, and there are some wives that are just way too touchy with other men that are not their husbands. I mean, it's just, it gets inappropriate sometimes. I mean, imagine there's the married man at work, and he wants to check in on his secretary's uh, spreadsheet he's working on, supposedly. So he's like, oh, let me check on the spreadsheet. How are you doing on this? Wow, you're doing great. Wonderful, I, what in the world? That's inappropriate, right? And so there's levels of contact married people should not be having with people of the opposite gender who are not their spouse, all right? Um, I remember one time we heard about a pastor, not at this church, uh, not even in this city, but we heard about a pastor who had had an affair with his secretary. And he said, he goes, you know where I really went wrong? He says, when I was giving my secretary a massage, I just started going too low. And, and the three of us said, what in the world? But we know where you went wrong. Why in the world were you giving your secretary a massage? And so the point is, there are levels of physical contact married people should not be having with people of the opposite gender who are not their spouse, all right? You get what I'm saying. Now, what if this sermon is too late? What if there's already been adultery in your marriage? Well, you need so much more than the tiny little bit that we're gonna be able to go over tonight. But I want you to know that God can help you and I want you to know that your church family is here for you. And I wanna at least give you somewhere to start tonight. And what I would encourage you is if you've been through that, there's a great little book called How to Help Your Spouse Heal from Your Affair by Linda McDonald. This is probably the best book that I've read on the subject. I've read many, many, many books on the subject. Um, and it also happens to be the shortest book on the subject. And so it is very rare that the best book in a category is also the shortest, but that's true this time. So I would encourage you. The, the great thing about this book is I encourage you to read it with your spouse, and it's gonna be tough, but it will give you a game plan for how to work on moving forward within your marriage, okay? Now, we've talked about fleeing from the temptation of adultery. What about fleeing from the temptation of pornography? Well, I wanna give you some examples tonight, real world examples, of how to stay far away from that temptation. So. One of the biggest is that every single person in here should have protective software on every device that you have that can access the internet. 
if you have any devices that can access the internet, but you can't put protective software on them, you need to get rid of those devices. For instance, there are some gaming systems that can access the internet, but you can't put protective software on there. If you are trying to live life with unmonitored internet access, you will fail. In fact, you probably already have. And so we cannot allow ourselves to have unmonitored computer access, or at least unmonitored internet access. Now, there are two different types of software that every person in this room needs. First of all, there is software called filters. A filter is what it sounds like, it's a filter. It blocks bad stuff from coming in, and that's good. We should have that on our devices. Another kind of software is called accountability software. Now, let me explain how this works. Uh, for example, on my phone, I have a software called Covenant Eyes. Now, it's not the only accountability software out there, but it's the one that my wife and I have been using for 15 years or something like that. So here's how it works. You designate an accountability partner. So my wife is my accountability partner. So what happens is every two weeks, she gets a list of every single thing that I've looked at on my phone. And if the software comes to the conclusion that I'm looking at something bad, then it will immediately send my wife a message, we think your husband is looking at something bad, you need to contact them and see what's happening. And so we need this kind of software on all of our devices, every single device that we have internet access to. Now, um, here at the church, all of our computers have both. Every single one of our computers at the church have filters to block bad stuff from coming in. They also have accountability software. Our IT department, some of which are sitting in this room right now, gets reports of everything that everybody in the church looks at. We need to put up those kind of barriers within our life. At home, my wife and I have an additional level of protection, which is something called Disney Circle. And it's a little device. And what it does, it doesn't uh, monitor just one device. It monitors our entire Wi-Fi router. So all the internet that's coming in and out of our house goes through the Disney Circle. That way, if someone, like a friend of one of our kids or something, brings in a new device into the house, it's still getting monitored through the Wi-Fi system. Another example of ways to flee the temptation of pornography is that there may be channels that you have access to on your TV that you need to cancel. There may be apps that you need to get rid of. There may be movies that you need to throw out. There may be magazines or catalogs that you need to stop subscribing to or you need to ask your spouse to stop subscribing to, right? Now, it sounds strange, but the key to protecting yourself in your marriage against sexual sin is to not trust yourself. Sometimes people say, oh, Brian, come on. I'm never going to do any of the kind of stuff you're talking about. Well, the Proverbs say pride comes before fall. And so we need to not trust ourselves, and instead we need to uh, make sure that we have levels of accountability within our life. Now, let me give a little side note, but it's an important side note. Not only do we need to make sure that we are limiting our exposure and that we are limiting our unmonitored internet access, but we also need to make sure that we're limiting our kids' possibility of exposure and the possibility of our kids having unmonitored computer access. If your kids have unmonitored internet access, you are setting them up for failure. They are gonna fail. And so we need to make sure they don't have unmonitored internet access. Um, most parents start thinking about this years too late. The average age of exposure for a male to pornography is 10 years old. Most parents are like 20 years too late by the time it's happened. And so you need to lock down every device in your house tight so that your kids, especially your sons, don't have unmonitored computer access. Now, it's tough because not only do you have to consider how locked down the devices in your house are, but you've also got to consider how locked down are the devices everywhere else they go. For example, a lot of the ways that young boys get exposed to pornography is at a friend's house or during a sleepover at a friend's house. And so we can't just ask the question, how locked down are the devices in our house? We also have to consider how locked down are the devices at their friend's house, right? Or at school. It is tough raising boys in today's culture because most of the boys at the elementary school have smartphones and they are showing each other pornography at school. And so you have got to be vigilant and diligent, not just about ourselves, but also about our kids.
Now, if pornography is something you struggle with, you need so much more than the little bit that we're going over tonight. But let me at least give you some place to start. I would encourage you and your spouse, if you're married, to read the book, Finally Free by Heath Lambert. Finally Free by Heath Lambert. It's the best book I've ever read on the subject, and I would strongly encourage uh, you to read it, and if you're married, to read it with your spouse. Another principle that we see in Proverbs chapter five to help us protect our marriages is to look to your spouse to get your needs met. So we're gonna get real here. And you know, the Bible is not afraid to tackle real life problems. And the Proverbs are surprisingly practical. I mean, the Proverbs, they don't dodge any real life situations, right? And so the next passage we look at is gonna get very real and intensely practical. So take a deep breath, buckle up your seatbelts, here we go. Proverbs chapter five, starting in verse 15. Solomon says to his sons, he says, drink water from your own cistern and running water from your own well. Should your fountains be dispersed abroad, streams of water in the streets? Let them be only your own and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth. As a loving deer and a graceful doe, let her breast satisfy you at all times and always be enraptured with her love. For why should you, my son, be enraptured by an immoral woman and be embraced in the arms of a seductress. Now, here in this passage, Solomon is using poetic metaphor. He's using very vivid imagery. In fact, imagery that is almost uncomfortably vivid. And here in this passage, the wife is compared to a water well, a cistern. And Solomon's point to his sons is this, that if they grow up and get married, and they find themselves figuratively thirsty and in need of a drink, then they should go to their wife to get their thirst quenched, not to some other woman. That they should be enraptured by their wife's love, not by another woman's love. Now wives, let me ask you, wouldn't you rather your husbands be enraptured by your love instead of enraptured by some other woman's love? Yet, there are a lot of wives who sort of resent the fact that their husbands are so enraptured with their love. There are a lot of spouses who withhold this kind of love from their spouses. Have you ever thought about it this way before? Your spouse has a need, and if your spouse is going to follow God's way, then you are the only person on earth who can meet that particular need. Now, your spouse has other needs that other people can meet. Your spouse needs food, but there are other people who can provide food. Your spouse needs air, but you don't have to be the one to supply air for them. But there is one need that you are the only person on earth who can help your spouse with, at least without them sinning. Now in the New Testament, Paul says basically the same thing that Solomon says here in Proverbs. Look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse five. Paul is speaking to married couples, and he says, do not deprive one another, except with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. What Paul is saying here is Paul is speaking to married couples and telling them not to deprive one another. And what Paul means is that physical intimacy should be a regular part of a marriage relationship. In fact, Paul says there's only one reason that a married couple should take a break from regular intimacy. And the reason he gives is he says, accept with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. What in the world does that mean? Here's what that means. This is, this is intense. Paul says that there may be times in your marriage where there is something you need to pray about as a couple so badly that you need to scrape together every possible minute you can in the day to pray for that thing. And so there may be a situation in which a married couple decides to give up food and sex for a while so they can devote all of that time to intense hardcore prayer. Now I know what you're thinking, that you may have never wanted to pray that bad within your life. <laughs> uh, but prayer is another subject, we'll have to talk about that in another sermon. <clears throat> okay, uh, 
a fourth uh, principle that we learn from Proverbs chapter five to protect our marriage is that we need to remember that we can't hide anything from God. Look with me at Proverbs chapter five at the end of the chapter, starting in verse 21. Solomon says to his sons, he says, for the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all his paths. His own iniquities entrap the wicked man, and he is caught in the cords of his sin. Sometimes spouses think that they can get away with sexual sin. They think they can cheat and not get caught, or that they can look at pornography and not be seen. But the truth is, people pretty much always end up getting caught eventually. Even if somehow they beat the odds and somehow manage to keep it hidden from their spouse for the rest of their life, there is one person who they cannot keep it hidden from, God. In those moments of temptation, we need to pretend like God is standing right there beside us watching us. Because you know what? He is. Isn't that what Solomon said? He said, the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord. All right. So tonight we've seen four principles from Proverbs 5 to help us protect our marriage. In conclusion, if we're going to be wise, and if we're going to be a wise spouse or a future spouse someday, then we have got to get radical about protecting our marriages from sexual sin. In fact, look with me at a passage in which Jesus tells us exactly how radical we're supposed to get about this. Look with me in Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 27. This is part of the famous Sermon on the Mount that Jesus preached. And in Matthew chapter 5, verse 27, Jesus says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin... Pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Now, both of these passages are pretty famous passages. If you've been coming to church very long or reading the Bible very long, you've probably heard both of these passages before. But until tonight, did you ever notice that these passages are packaged together? They're connected. This passage about the adultery of the heart and this other passage about us us gouging out our eyes and chopping off our hands are connected. The context of this hand chopping off, eye gouging out stuff is in getting radical about protecting ourselves against sexual sin. Now, people always ask me, They say, Brian, is this literal? I mean, is Jesus really saying we're supposed to gouge out our eyes and chop off our hands? No, I don't think it is. If this was literal, every believer on earth should have no hands and no eyes. (laughs) I think this is metaphorical. Now, how do I know that it's metaphorical? I think the reason it's metaphorical is because even if it was literal, that wouldn't solve the problem that Jesus is addressing in this passage. You can chop off your hands and still sin. And you can gouge out your eyes and still lust. I think Jesus is making a stronger point than literally saying chop off your hands and gouge out your eyes. I think Jesus is saying do whatever it takes. Whatever radical steps you have to take to protect you and your marriage from sexual sin, you should do that. No matter what it costs, no matter how awkward it is, no matter how difficult it is, no matter how strange it is, no matter how much your friends are confused by your behavior or make fun of you for doing it, you need to do whatever it takes to protect your marriage. Now, the truth is that none of us have been radical enough. All of us have failed in one way or another when it comes to protecting our purity and to resisting sexual temptation. But the good news is that God loves us. And he sent Jesus to live the perfect life of purity for us. And then Jesus died on the cross to take the punishment for all of our sins, including all of our sexual sins. And three days later, Jesus rose from the dead, proving that he really was the son of God. And here's what the Bible says. That if you will just turn away from your old life and believe in Jesus, then you can be saved. You can be forgiven. 
and you can even be transformed. And so I wanna invite you, if you've never believed in Jesus before, please don't wait another day. Believe in Jesus tonight. Be forgiven and begin the process of being transformed. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, I know that this is a difficult topic, Lord, and and somewhat awkward to speak about in a mixed crowd. But God, I have trouble thinking of any other topic in our culture that is more needed. And so God, I pray, Lord, that the words of Solomon, which are ultimately your words inspired by the Holy Spirit, would inspire us and challenge us to be radical about protecting our purity, whether we're single or whether we're married. God, for all those in the room who have suffered because of breaches in their marriage, Lord, I pray that you would strengthen them, comfort them, and help them to find the support and the help that they need to heal and to move forward. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.